Nelson Mandela served 27 years in prison, locked up for the crime of resisting the apartheid government, the government that had subjugated his people. And after 27 years, he was re released. And I don't think it's an understatement to say that not only the national, but the international spotlight was upon him. For everyone knew who he was going in. He was a great leader, a boxer, just a, a someone who could gather people by force of personality, an activist, someone with the potential to make a difference. But 27 years of hard labor in prison, what's that do to a person? And so as he was coming out, there's this moment where the world held its breath to see who he was now. And as he came out, he showed that he was an amazing person, an amazing disciple of Jesus, because he did something just, uh, just blows your mind. He forgave. He forgave. What he writes of that moment is he, he writes, as I walked out, the door from, toward my freedom. I knew that if I did not leave all the anger, hatred, and bitterness behind, that I would still be in prison. And so he leaves prison behind, and he forgave. And in forgiving, he transforms a tragedy into a miracle. In forgiving, he becomes the person who has the standing, the authority, the sheer force of character to turn the nation towards a new way. To not lead the nation into retribution and trials, nor to attempt national amnesia and forget anything happened, but to embrace the ways of forgiveness and reconciliation. Two weeks ago I spoke about Desmond Tutu and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it is true that Desmond Tutu sort of shepherded that along, but the person who made it happen at all, the one who made it possible for South Africa to have a future, is Nelson Mandela when he walked out of prison and forgave. He was strong enough to forgive, and it changed the world. And it showed up in all the... It, when Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as president, you know who had the seat of honor? His jailer. That's the one who had one of the highest seats of honor. It changed the nation. Now, when we forgive, it may not change the world in quite that way, but it does change our world. When we forgive, it changes our church, it changes our family, it changes our community. When we forgive and rebuild, we are transforming tragedy into miracle. And we are being ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of reconciliation. When we choose to forgive, to put it as bluntly as possible, we stop playing the devil's game. We stop playing the game of retribution and revenge. And we start walking towards the kingdom of God. These few weeks we've been looking at the details of how to do this. How, do, how exactly do we forgive? It's, it's easy to talk about forgiveness, but when you're actually bleeding, what do you do? And we've been using this image uh, Adam Hamilton has put together that whenever someone sins against you, it's like they're handing you a rock. And you've got to choose what to do with that. Do you hold on to that weight, that burden? And, and if you do, it, you, your life gets really heavy really fast, especially when the sins are large. And so uh, what Adam Hamilton teaches, and, and I want to pa have been passing along to you is that when it comes to the small things, the small sins, the small annoyances, we first remember that we're not perfect, assume the best about people, and then pray for them. And if we do that day in and day out, we'll, we'll stop holding these small weights and, and life gets easier. Last week we talked about what about the uh, the larger burdens, the bigger sins, the things that actually you can't just overlook, where you got to deal with them. We talked about the way we handle that. Matthew 5 tells us that if I'm the one who sinned against you, I run to you, and I go out of my way to go find you and sit down and work it out. And if, uh, I, re if I have been offended, if I'm the one who's been hurt, I go to that person. This is Matthew 18. If, if I'm the one who's offended, I go to that person and I sit down and I work it out and if I need help, I bring it. And, and in, in sitting down and rebuilding, we sit down and, and we start to rebuild what was broken and, and that it takes what it takes to rebuild the relationship. Pretend, not pretending it can go back the way it was, but rebuilding something new. And then, then we as a community are called to hold people together and, and, and help them do this such that when someone is talking about it and, and maybe gossiping, maybe we, we might do that on occasion, that we as a community can say to them, I love you both. 
I can't wait for you to reconcile. Are you going to the rodeo tonight? I mean, there's... I can't wait for you to get back together. I'm praying for you. And, and, you know, we've been getting a lot of rain lately. Change the topic. Just don't allow it to percolate and to keep on going. And so that's what we established that last week. That's how you deal with, with these sort of medium stones, the bitter sins. But what do you do with the, the large ones? What do you do with the times when someone hands you a burden and you can barely walk because that hurts so much? Betrayals, <coughs> backstabbings. When someone destroys your career, shatters your family, what do you do? Can that be forgiven? Can you put that down? Or is that a weight you're going to carry forever? To get our minds around this, we're going to turn first to Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, because that's what we all think of now, Joseph. Because if anyone was sinned against, it was Joseph, right? Joseph, who uh, growing up, he was a bit of an arrogant, narcissistic twerp. Uh, he was just kind of a... Yeah, he, he is the favored son of the twelve. And his father gives him this coat. A multicolored, call it what you will. But that word is hard to translate, but what I can tell you about that word is it shows up one other time and it describes the coat that a bride wears on her wedding day. And so when he shows up in the fields and his other brothers are working and he's wearing this coat that is obviously not meaning he's about to chip in and help and he starts talking about, oh, I have these great dreams and, and you're going to be bowing down before me. He is sinning against his brothers and they respond by throwing him in the well and selling him into slavery and then he spends the next 13 years in, in slavery and in prison. And then going through, fast forwarding through the story quickly, he ends up in a position of power and authority, saves Egypt from famine, and then the family has to come and get food from Egypt because they're in famine as well. And, and Joseph has these brothers in front of him, and uh, he reveals himself uh, to them, and, and he feeds them, and he embraces them and gives them land. And uh, what we get to in the story today is near the end where the father, uh, Jacob, has died and the brothers still don't really believe they've been forgiven. They think he's just been biding his time. He's going to get him. It's just a matter of when. And so, realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they go to Joseph and they make up this story, right? That, you know, your dad, not our dad, your dad told us, you know, make sure to tell you that, you know, you got to forgive us. And Joseph then weeps when this happens because he, he's wrought up by the fact they don't get it. They don't understand. This has been, they've been forgiven. And he tells them, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I will provide for you and for your children. And so Joseph, the narcissistic, self-centered little twerp, has grown up and matured and he is able to be graceful. And tragedy is transformed into miracle. It did take a while for him to be able to do this, right? He didn't forgive his brothers after a month or a year. It was a long time before he saw them again. But in the process of growing up, he was able to, to grow into this commitment to, to God who forgives and then forgive himself. He was able to redeem this tragedy and turn it to good. We can do the same. We can do the same. When someone hands us one of these, we can do the same. When someone backstabs us or lies or there's infidelity, the question, how we do it though, is the same thing we do any, any, any other thing we do. One day at a time. The way you forgive a burden like this is one day at a time. When someone hands you a rock of this size, you can't get rid of it in one day, but what you can do is today, when you have an opportunity to hurt that person back, to desecrate their memory, to talk smack about them, to take a swing, when you choose to forgive someone, you chip off a little bit of that rock. And maybe you forgive them later that day. You might forgive someone five, six, 23 times a day. Every time you choose not to hurt that person, you are chipping a little bit off of that rock. It's not about what you feel, it's about what you do. Every time you don't twist the knife, you don't hurt him back, either by what you say or by what you do not say, you chip off a little bit off that rock. Every time you pray for your enemy, you pray God's blessing upon them, you pray that their life turns to the better and that their soul is healed and that their family does well. Every time you pray for your enemy, you chip off a little bit of this rock 
and the burden gets less. Every time that you find joy and you do not let that burden dominate your life and you find the, the time to, to laugh and to smile, you're chipping a little bit off that rock. Day by day, one day at a time. Joseph was not able or ready to forgive his brothers right after it happened. Rome wasn't built in a day and we're not going to be able to deal with something like this just overnight. But it can be chipped away. And what we do and what we feel becomes secondary, right? When we're hurting, when we're bleeding, when someone has handed us something like this, what we're going to feel for a while is rage and anger and pain. And that's not what determines our future. What determines our future is what we do. And when we start chipping off pieces of this rock, one chip at a time, how we feel will start to follow. If I choose to forgive you again and again and again, eventually how I feel will start to follow what I'm doing. Now, there might even come a time when we're carrying such a burden that we might even dare to pray that such a burden might be redeemed, that God might use it. Who here knows who Patrick Stewart is? Captain Picard? I grew up watching Captain Picard, 6 o'clock Saturday night, Star Trek The Next Generation. And, uh, or Professor Xavier, depending if you're a little bit younger. And Patrick Stewart, this great British actor, he's, he's been acting for years now. Uh, he was raised in a family with domestic violence. As he puts it, he was raised uh, with a man who could control neither his emotions nor his fists. And, and he watched his mother get beat time and time again. And, and he talks about how uh, after a while you begin to believe it's your fault, that you're responsible for it as you, if you're a young child in such a situation. And at this point, years later, he has moved through that, chipped away at that stone, put, sort of let go of that, that boulder, and now it has become one of his life's passions. In Britain, it's not so much in America, but in Britain he is heavily involved in raising awareness and in, in prevention of domestic violence because he knows how much he is hurt by it and has become part of his life's goal to help others. Right? And it's not just famous pre people who have this happen, right? Donnie Folks. You all know Donnie. He lost the ability to walk at a very young age, right? Teenager. I don't know the details of how that happened. Here's what I do know. Before he died last year, what I'm told is that he said he would not change it, anything because he was then able to spend his life helping those who had been hurt in the same way he had. And he could help those young fellows who had been paralyzed. He could show up and help them. And he would not trade anything for the people he had been able to meet and help. And that is what, we're talk what I'm talking about when I say we might dare to pray that God might redeem the pain that we're going through, the burden that, we have, that has been placed upon us. Now, we may then go ahead and rebuild the relationship. When someone has hurt us this bad, it might be that we rebuild the relationship. We might not. Maybe someone has hurt us so bad that it's just not going to be rebuilt this side of heaven. It's the same thing as rebuilding after any sin. If both sides are willing, if both sides are, if there is repentance, if there is change, if there is a commitment to living differently, maybe a relationship can be rebuilt. Maybe not. No easy answers on that. And finally, none of this denies the fact that there are consequences for our actions, right? If someone hurts us and it is not just amoral but illegal and they go before the judge, we are not going to go up to the judge and say, sorry, just let them off. I forgive them so they could just go free. But no, no, that's not the case. But we stand before the judge and we say something particular. We, we do not stand before the judge and say, get them back, hurt them bad as they hurt me. We stand before the judge as Christians and we say something different. St. Augustine, the way he puts this in the 4th century, he writes a letter to a judge who is about to give the, the sentence for someone who has killed his friends. And so what he writes to this judge, who's, who's going to decide the fate of these people who have killed his friends, he writes, We do not wish the suffering of the servants of God avenged by the affliction of precisely similar injuries by way of retaliation. Be not provoked by the atrocity of their sinful deeds to gratify the passion of revenge, but rather be moved by the wounds which these deeds have inflicted on their own souls to exercise a desire to heal them. There are consequences, and people who are, who, whose souls are so dark that they would hurt another like this, 
there is a need for healing and the consequences need to be directed towards that restoration. Don't hurt them so you can hurt them. Let the consequences be directed towards restoration of what's broken. Now, there are some truly hard cases, right? There's things like domestic abuse. I, I talked to Judy Potts about this earlier this week. Domestic abuse. When someone is in a domestic abuse situation, leave. And don't forgive, but don't try to rebuild, because just it's almost impossible to rebuild after domestic bu abuse. What if the other person, do, another hard case, what if the other person doesn't acknowledge that anything is wrong? Well... You can't rebuild if the other person doesn't acknowledge it's broken. You forgive them, but you can't rebuild it. And you might need to ask yourself, are you being a little bit overreactive? There was a time I was working in the hospital as a chaplain, and uh, a lady in front of a group of other chaplains questioned whether I was really a Christian. And I got a little bit hot over that. Just, just a little. And, uh, and afterwards... Another chaplain pulled me aside and said, Andy, she pushed your buttons, but they're your buttons. And, and, and you know, ain't that the truth? Someone can push your buttons, but at the end of the day, they're your buttons. And maybe, just maybe, you might be o overreacting just, just a bit. Other hard cases. When the person you, who has hurt you is dead, you can forgive them anyways. Maybe write a letter. Burn it. We, we read in scripture about how prayer, the incense that rises to God is like prayer, and maybe we do the same. Maybe you go and you talk to their grave, have it out with them even if they can't say anything back. For me, the hardest case, and, and if you have any wisdom on this, I'm all ears, the hardest case is forgiving a system. How do you forgive a hospital that didn't care for a loved one, or a school that didn't take care of your kid? How do you forgive a system? I mean, you forgive them, you don't try to hurt them back, but I don't I don't fully understand how you do that. So uh, if you all have that figured out, please let me know. Before we start to wrap up, are there any other hard cases, any other questions you want to throw out there and watch me dance? Okay. We're called to forgive even in these hard cases because we have been forgiven first. We read in Matthew 18 that the servant is forgiven. The, the Greek says uh, 10,000 talents. A talent is a hunk of gold. I mean, this is so much money that you can't make in your lifetime. Your family can't make it in your lifetime. Maybe your great-grandchildren, if they, you start saving now, your great-grandchildren could make that much money. This is a vast sum that, that this servant is forgiven. And then he goes nail someone to the wall for $10. Right? And the king says, king standing in for God, I forgave you. You better go out and forgive the same. We are forgiven and our lives have been transformed by it. Because... You know what it's like to carry a burden? I mean, and to be forgiven, to be able to let that burden down, not have to carry the weight of our sin, is just an amazing thing. And so to go out and have our lives transformed by that and not be willing to offer it to others is a tragedy. And we don't want to forgive because we are afraid it might make the situation worse or we might look weak or we don't want to risk trusting people, especially when we have been hurt before. But i got to tell you, my friends, when we refuse to give, we are playing the devil's game. We are doing this eye for an eye thing, and we're going to be blind, and we will not see how we are dragging each other down into the very pits of hell. You might think that's strong language, and it is. But that's where I stand, and that's where the scriptures stand. If we are not willing to forgive, we are playing the devil's game, and we are dragging each other down to the detriment of our souls and our salvation. And the shame is, is that when we walk out that door, there will be people who will encourage us to do it. There will be people who will mean well and who love us, who will encourage us to get even, who will encourage us to get back at each other, who will encourage us to, 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 to play this game of tit for tat that I've got to get, and encourage us not to break that cycle of violence and revenge. But Jesus has forgiven us, and we can forgive others. He calls us to be citizens of the kingdom of God where people are forgiven, stones are put down, burdens are let go. Jesus says, my burden is light, my yoke is easy. When we go forth to forgive, we stop playing the devil's game and we change the world. The person who hurt me will always be the person who hurt me. But when I forgive them and rebuild with them, they can become my friend again. 
That is the way of the kingdom of God. That is the way of God's peace. That is the way to heaven. It is not the easy way, but it is the way towards fasting or feasting. It is the way towards community. It is the way towards celebration and song. It is the way of Jesus Christ. Go forth this day, not as part of the world, part of the world's cycle of violence, but go forth to forgive and to change it. Amen.